back to me, Ray Bryant here in Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna give you some perspectives on some of the BMPs that we're putting in place to uh, try to improve water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. So today I'll give you a brief introduction to the Chesapeake Bay model and uh, TMDL assessment in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, total maximum daily load. Uh, I'll talk first about some of the BMPs that are gaining acceptance in the Chesapeake Bay watershed and then talk about some new BMPs that are under consideration for inclusion in the Chesapeake Bay model. Now, the Chesapeake Bay model is our reality in the Chesapeake Bay. When it comes to determining the progress of the seven states that you see here that are uh, part of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, it's the model that determines how this, the amount of progress that the states are making towards meeting these total maximum daily loads. Um, the approximately a little less than 40% of the nitrogen that gets to the Chesapeake Bay is coming from agriculture and a little bit more than 40% of the phosphorus that gets to the Chesapeake Bay is coming from agriculture. <clears throat> and um, I was thinking after listening to Matt and Laura and the heavy emphasis on nitrogen in the Midwest, and uh, rightly so. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is an estuary, so we have a lot of water coming in from this drainage from the north, from the Susquehanna River, and it's fresh water through a lot of the bay. Then it turns brackish, and then almost full saline before it exits into the Atlantic Ocean. And nitrogen is a limiting element in saline water, but phosphorus is a limiting nutrient in freshwater. So we have a lot more emphasis on both phosphorus and nitrogen than perhaps what you're looking at in the Midwest. However, phosphorus would be critically important to the health of your streams and lakes uh, before the water exits into the Gulf of Mexico. Now you might not be able to see the details of the model structure, but basically the model gets inputs on how much, how much nutrients are coming in for agricultural purposes, like through fertilizer sales, et cetera, uh, through ag census data, and it's proportioned to the subcatchments throughout the Chesapeake Bay. The model looks at the land use in terms of acreage, and then it begins, it, it calculates uh, the amount of nutrients that's gonna leave that agricultural land and make it to the Chesapeake Bay. However, if you implement BMPs that are contained in the model and you report them, then you can get a credit for a reduction in the amount of nutrients that will eventually get to the, all the way to the Chesapeake Bay. So I'll talk about some well-established practices such as nutrient management, and those would be like the phosphorus index uh, and then good nitrogen management. Uh, conservation tillage is well established. I would say in Pennsylvania, approximately 60% of the cropland is under some kind of conservation tillage. And then I'll talk about in more detail these practices that are gaining adoption, such as cover crops and manure injection. So cover crops in Maryland are fairly easy. They have a longer growing season, and so after harvest, they can they actually have a program that the state pays for, and they fly on the seed to plant a rye cover crop, and farmers are pretty much uh, under pressure or regulation to participate in that program. So here is a rye cover crop in late spring. You can see it's in a uh, field that was previously in corn. So cover crops in Maryland are ubiquitous and fairly easy. As you go north though, we have more of a problem in Pennsylvania because um, by the time our crops come off, it's getting pretty late in the season. It's very difficult to establish a, a cover crop in time to protect it before winter really shuts everything down. So our colleagues at Penn State have invented a cover crop interseeder and a technology for planting cover crop in an established cornfield uh, between V4 to V7 stage. It's basically a planter that's on stilts. But when everything works right, you can get that cover crop going before the corn completely shades it out. It will survive under the shade. 
and then really take off as soon as you harvest the corn. And of course, some of the uh, benefits is that the cover crop prevents soil erosion, enhances soil carbon, and then from our water quality, it will hold those nutrients over the winter. We have a lot of uh, dairy production in Pennsylvania and uh, New York, especially. And our manure is handled through a liquid manure system. And so traditionally, we just broadcast that liquid manure onto the soil surface. Uh, it's recommended that you till that manure in, get it off of the surface. But of course, if you're practicing no-till, that's not very desirable. So there are several technologies that have been developed uh, for injecting manure and uh, maintaining conditions of minimum tillage. And so the idea is that if you have manure on the surface, you're going to have a lot of ammonia loss uh, when that manure just lies there on the surface in the first one or two days after application. But if you can get that manure into the ground, you can drastically lower that ammonia loss. The same is true for phosphorus. If the phosphorus is on the surface, then it's more subject to runoff. So we've compared a lot of these new technologies and the one that we think has some of the best uh, performance is shallow disc injection. Now the disc injector does do a fair amount of uh, disturbance of the surface of the soil, uh, but it does control ammonia losses and, and phosphorus losses the best. And we've worked with Natural Resource Conservation Service uh, to have this considered a, a conservation tillage measure. So I'm going to go through some emerging practices that uh, we've been working with. And here's a list of them just for your reference. Since I'm going to be going through all of them, I won't go down the list at this time, but we'll start with litter injection. Now this is poultry litter because out on the eastern shore, of Maryland on the coastal plain, right next to the uh, Chesapeake Bay, is a high concentration of, of poultry production. And our colleagues in Alabama and Arkansas has, have developed what they term, what they named the subsurfer, poultry litter applicator. Now we've worked with that and tested it, and there are some concerns. The original design used augers to move the litter to the front of the uh, implement where the injection takes place and litter, dry litter drops down into a slot that's opened by a disc and then it's covered. And it does a very nice job except that these litter, these uh, augers tend to get clogged up. So most recently we're working with uh, engineering firm to sort of, uh, what we did was insert an, uh, a hopper in right on top of the existing bed and it uses a moving floor to move the litter to the front, and that's worked a lot better. We installed a flail chopper to chop it up better so that it passes down through the injectors better. And we use augers to move the litter laterally out to the sides. And what this does is enable us to perhaps um, engineer to add some wings onto the uh, subsurfer so that it expands our width of application and speeds up our application rate. Our colleagues at Oklahoma State and University of Kentucky are working with a different technology. They're doing some extreme chopping of the litter to get it down to dust size, and then trying to use air seeder technology to move it out into a broader swath of application uh, and using litter, um, air, to uh, blow the litter out to the injector ports. I worked with some of my colleagues at University of Maryland Eastern Shore and Virginia Tech on conservation practice standard number 333. Uh, it's titled Amending Soil Properties with Chipsiferous Products. And so uh, there are a couple of purposes for putting, uh, conservation purposes for applying gypsum to the surface of soils. Number one, it can reduce dissolved phosphorus concentrations in surface runoff and subsurface drainage. And that's because the gypsum, calcium sulfate, will dissolve and the calcium will precipitate with the phosphorus, making it insoluble. 
And the second purpose is to improve soil physical and chemical properties to increase infiltration by improving the soil structure and thereby reducing soil erosion, which reduces sediment loss as well as nutrient loss when that nutrient is associated with the particulate. Next, I'm going to talk about some best management practices that are under consideration for the next version of the Chesapeake Bay Watershed model. Uh, I currently chair a panel that was convened to advise the modelers on which best management practices are suitable for inclusion in the Chesapeake in the next version of the Chesapeake Bay model. Uh, my colleague Laura Christensen, that you just heard from, is also on this panel. And so we're charged with just reviewing the science on some fairly new practices, uh, recommending the modelers how much uh, nutrient reductions could be obtained through implementing these practices, and advising them on how we can measure uh, the extent of the application of these practices so that they can uh, quantify them in the uh, simulation model. So on our list is looking at uh, water control structures. And as I said, even, as, even though these are perhaps well-established uh, measures in some other parts, particularly out in the Midwest where you are, uh, they are not currently uh, recognized in the Chesapeake Bay model. So we have to assess their effectiveness in our landscapes uh, for reducing nitrogen or phosphorus loads and recommending to the model how effective these are. And Laura has already given you a good explanation of how they work, so I'll move on to her favorite, denitrifying bioreactors. And this is a ditch diversion design. The reason that we're still doing research on bioreactors when Laura is busy implementing them in the Midwest is that um, our, tip, our landscapes on the eastern shore of Maryland are very flat. If we get to 3% slope, we start talking about a hillside. Uh, but what we can do in working with these very low hydraulic head gradients um, is come up with some innovative designs. And Laura has worked with us in collaboration to come up with some pretty uh, interesting designs which, where we are having some success. And I want to tell you about those. First of all, a wood chip bioreactor on the eastern shore um, is best designed something like this. This is a ditch diversion design where control structure diverts the water out of the ditch through the bioreactor. The wood chips uh, result in microbial denitrification and conversion nitrate to um, ammonium, I mean, to uh, atmospheric nitrogen. And then a control structure releases the water back into the ditch where it can move on down uh, through the drainage. And this does take land out of cultivation unless you have an existing crep buffer. So there are some places where this would be uh, suitable. Another innovation design that Laura came up with is to dig a trench parallel to an ag drainage ditch and mix a 50% sawdust, 50% soil mixture and backfill it into the trench. And so the hydrology here in these very flat landscapes is that a lot of our water moves to the ditch, comes from the field underground and shallow groundwater flow. It would uh, experience denitrification as it passes through the sawdust wall and then moves on over into the ditch. And we found that we are getting some denitrification with the sawdust wall as well. Uh, this is an in-ditch bioreactor design where you don't have the luxury of uh, having uh, fallow land next to the ditch. A lot of the farmers farm right up to the edge of the ditch. And to explain this one, we have excavated the bottom of the ditch. Here's the profile of the top of the ditch as you move down uh, stream. And then here's the profile of the bottom of the ditch. And so what we've done is excavated out of the bottom of the ditch and constructed some uh, bioreactor cells, three of them in sequence. And when one fills up and gets saturated, it flows over a wooden berm, enters the second one. And if that one gets filled up, it flows over the third one. 
And finally, in a high event, it might just be flowing through all of it, but the uh, water that has the nitrate removed then exits through a, a tile drain at the bottom of the system. And that one, we're documenting lower nitrate concentrations as well. Laura talked about saturated buffers, so we're evaluating those for our landscapes. And just to review, it instead of the tile drain going to directly to the stream, it goes laterally and release the nutrients and water through the saturated buffer where you can have nutrient uptake uh, through the riparian buffer. She also mentioned two-stage ditch. This might be what one looks like where you've got a little mini floodplain uh, next to your channel, and that floodplain can trap sediment as well as uh, nutrients. We're looking at uh, blind inlet subsurface drains. Uh, you may be familiar with the tile risers where you have a wet spot out in the middle of the field that allows water to enter the uh, tile drain. It moves underground then and exits the field. A blind inlet is a gravel pad with the drain underneath it, and then you can cover that back up with soil. And the advantage here is that uh, you can farm across it, which farmers really like that idea. It's effective at draining the low spot. Plus, um, you don't get as much sediment moving into the tile drain. So if you reduce the sediment, you also reduce the phosphorus that is perhaps attached to that sediment. Then there's phosphorus removal system, sort of in a broad sense. This is Dr. Chad Penn. He's with USDA ARS in Indiana, and he's worked on this quite a lot. Any kind of a byproduct that contains iron, calcium and or aluminum potentially can sorb phosphorus. And sorbing means that the phosphorus is stuck to the uh, outer surface of these particles that are high in these elements. And so you can build a filter field with something like an iron slag from a smelter uh, that would be high in iron or aluminum. And you route drainage water into this filter and it will sorb any dissolved phosphorus. So it's a very effective way to get rid of dissolved phosphorus. And this is a similar technology in that it's using gypsum, which again is a calcium, calcium sulfate compound. But it's a project that we worked on Eastern Shore. The concept is similar to the sawdust wall where you have an ag ditch and we've trenched right next to the ag, uh, ag ditch and filled it with gypsum. And here it is on the University of Maryland Eastern Shore campus, and we've got a bunch of wells that are measuring phosphorus concentrations in groundwater that's coming from the field. Our curtain is here, and then we've got wells that are measuring the concentration after the water passes through the gypsum curtain. And we do find that it does not uh, do any damage to the crop. In fact, the soybeans next to the ditch look even better than uh, when they have the gypsum there than when they don't. And a little cartoon just to show you how this works. Remember that we're on very flat, flat landscapes, only nine or 10 feet above uh, mean sea level. And so when it rains, our water tables come to the surface. And if we have a gypsum curtain in place, then we see phosphorus concentrations of several parts per million. And when it gets to the gypsum, the dissolved phosphorus precipitates as calcium phosphate, and then we have low concentrations moving on to the ditch. And 90% of the nutrients that get to the ditch move by this shallow groundwater flow pathway. Only 10% of the nutrients enter through overland flow. <laughs> 